Hey, it's Joe with Jolie Farms in Ecuador. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to have another X-Files interview. There's that noise again. So the reason we do these interviews with expats is so that me and my little green friend here can introduce you to people who have already moved here to Ecuador and to share their experiences. We think there's some great information that these people have to give. Today is no exception. This couple is uh, gonna be so informative. Can't wait till you watch this video all the way through. They're gonna give you three facts in this video that you need to know about moving to Ecuador. Hope you'll stay tuned because we're gonna get right to it. Welcome back. We're here with my good friends, Charlie and Delisa. Charlie and Delisa, thank you so much for being here today. Appreciate sure. it. Our pleasure. <laughs> so Charlie and Delisa have been in Vilcabamba. About nine months, almost. Almost. Nine almost. months? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, that's pretty new. Yeah, we're yeah. gestating. We're about to give birth here. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I want to ask, where did you live before you came to Vilcabamba? Alaska. Alaska. Mm -hmm. South Central Alaska. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a great place, huh? Yeah, it was mm -hmm. actually. We had a nice house on a little lake and go out there on my kayak almost every day during the summer. And we thought we Can would we... never leave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have you met our friend B yet? She lives here. She's from Alaska. I don't think yeah. we have. We've oh, heard we've story. heard about her because everybody says, "Oh, you're from Alaska. Then you must know B." We said, "No, we don't know B. <laughs> <laughs> we know that B is here because we hear about B. We yeah. we have met another woman named Kate that or Kate that's from Alaska. We've had a lot of people from Alaska visit Vilcabamba. And as a matter of fact, some people brought us some hats down, some Alaska hats. Oh, <laughs> we wear those quite frequently. Hmm. And uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. So, uh, what made you think and move to Vilcabamba? I mean, what was behind that? Well, that's kind of an interesting story. <laughs> so, in 2005, we met a man by the name of Will who had was building a house in Vilcabamba. And he was telling us about it, and it sounded, wow, that sounds like a really nice place to go. But in that point in our lives, we weren't ready to even consider moving because we were taking care of her mother. And, you know, we had a life in Alaska. We just weren't ready to move. But we knew that this was a special place because Will had liked it so much and because he... You know, that was before all the online information, but I did do some research on it and, and it looked like, wow, that looks like a nice place. And then we forgot about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And life went on and on and on, and we were happily living in Alaska. And then last year in the very end of September, we talked to another friend of ours who had just moved from California to Florida and we were asking her, you know, what happened? Had to do with COVID. Anyway, <laughs> she happened to mention in this conversation that she had been planning to go to Vilcabamba to a retreat. And she said, oh, I think that's something you would really like, this retreat. And so she sent me a link to the retreat. And I started looking and I was saying to Charlie, I said, Vilcabamba, Vilcabamba, doesn't that ring a bell? Is that where... Will was living or moving? He said, I think it was. Yep. So I called Will. And he's not in Vilcabamba anymore, but they did build a house. And uh, he's, he's got a place in California, and he's an author who travels around promoting his message and his book. And so v traveling to and from Vilcabamba is extremely inconvenient. So he finally sold his house. But anyway, that put this little seed in our minds. Mm -hmm. And then... <laughs> yeah, and so I, I had gone to visit my sister and brother who live in Colorado and Mex in New Mexico. And so while I was down there visiting, she was researching. <laughs> and, and watching millions of YouTube videos. <laughs> and so she said to me at one point during the trip when I was talking to her, she says, well, I've been looking into Vilcabamba, and this little alarm went off in my head like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> what she got in her mind now. 
Mm -hmm. And then when he got back to Alaska, I picked him up at the airport in Anchorage, and on the way home, it's about an hour's drive, I said in my most casual voice, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of serious about Vilcabamba. <laughs> and, and he wasn't happy. <laughs> yeah, well, and I could tell just by, she was very excited about Vilcabamba. <laughs> and I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> So, and it, was, it wasn't the first time that she's kind of like, not really sprung something on me, but <laughs> it's like her excitement just kind of overtakes the whole, excite, the whole thing, you know? And so she's, so by the time we got home, I thought, well, I better start looking into this. <laughs> <laughs> so the next morning I got up and started doing some research and I thought, well, you know, that might not be such a bad place, you know? Ecuador's got a, one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. And I was like, I'm a nature photographer and that just sounded amazing. So maybe that's a good place to go explore. So by the next day, he said, okay, <laughs> let's go to Vilcabamba. And so we started seriously looking into it. We did have a little, uh, a dip in the excitement. Actually, it was before he came home when I did some research and it looked like they uh, yeah. were requiring masks and uh, immunizations, well, not immunizations, the shot. And I said, well, then I'm not going. But then when I talked to Will, he said, oh, they're not like that there. I'm sure even if they made the rule that, that they aren't gonna be you know, doing anything about it. So I said, and you're sure about that? We don't have to have that to go? He said, yeah, I'm sure about that. So anyway, but it was still online that it was required. So anyway, after we got through that, then we just started really, really watching a lot of the Abundant Living um, videos, which told us a lot about Vilcabamba, but it also had a lot of houses. <laughs> and property. And property for sale. And then they were having a retreat coming up, like starting the day after, or two days after Christmas. And so we were now into middle of October. And so by the end of October, we had decided on some property to buy. And it's just on the edge of town and it's just a little house. But we thought, well, it would be a good starting place, you know, and I wanted to be walking distance to town. And we really didn't have a sense of where things are. I mean, there were all these beautiful properties, but it's like, where are they? But we knew that this one was walking distance to town. We thought, that's a good starting point. So we, with the help of Abundant Living, we were able to get an attorney that we had power of attorney and we bought the house. We hadn't been down here yet. A house with a duplex apartment building. So we had two renters to come back to. Sight unseen. Sight, Sight unseen. unseen. Yeah. Right. Without even hesitating. When and just, we... just so everyone knows, this is exactly what we recommend you don't do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I'm very glad we did because, uh, well, part of this, you know, we didn't leave Alaska because of not liking Alaska. We loved Alaska and we had a gorgeous place, beautiful, amazing garden, um, wildlife all around. I mean, we had a really, really good life there. But one thing that we didn't have there was the ability to grow food year round. And we're vegans, and so we eat lots of vegetables. And so in the efforts of being more self-sufficient over the years, we've tried to figure out ways to be more self-sufficient, which is pretty darn hard to be in Alaska for anybody, and especially for vegans. And so, when we decided that we were going to come to Vilcabamba, the, one of the big pluses was 12 months of summer, 12 months of gardens. And there's more about that later. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that was a big one for me. Plus, I just, I love summer. It's not that I didn't like winter there, but I loved summer. And I grew up in Alaska, so I've had a lot of summers and a lot of winters there. But anyway, I was approaching 72 years old and I thought, how many summers do I have left? I, who knows? But however many it is, I've got four times more of them in Ecuador than I have in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the spirit of adventure, we made reservations to come down for the retreat. 
and we started the process of getting all our materials together for our visa and for selling everything, everything, because like you, we came down with just suitcases. Yeah. Yeah, that was a little painful at first because I had a lot of tools, you know. I was used to doing, making oh. stuff and building stuff and uh, that was hard, but I That's did. the hard I thing for us men, letting go of those tools. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I let go of uh, a roll around toolbox full of all kinds of tools, but a lot of snap-on tools in there. Yeah, yeah. You just can't get snap-on tools in Ecuador. Nope. Yeah. Stanley is about the best you're going to do here. It's, yeah. Uh, you, you, in a rare case, you might get DeWalt or something like that. But, yeah, okay. yeah, that, yeah, electrical stuff, DeWalt and all those brands are here, but when it comes to hand tools, it's, it's tough. Yeah, know? yeah. Or there's, there's not bad tools here, but nothing like a Snap-on or a Craftsman. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So um, can you tell us in, in moving here, what has been the biggest hardship, if you would, the, the thing that mm -hmm. sticks out in your mind as being a negative or that was tough to get around? Well, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't think there was a big hardship. I think there was some, a, a lot of adjusting, you know, to little things that you just don't have any sense of until you get here. You don't know what you don't know, right? Right. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, one of the kind of funny things is the sidewalks. I mean, <laughs> You go along the sidewalks and the first time is like, how does anybody go on these sides without killing themselves? I mean, you'll have a foot and a half, two foot drop off sometimes. And it's like, no warnings. Like you better be watching where you're going. Yeah. Consequently, we do like everybody else. We walk in the street. Walk in the street, it's easier. <laughs> it's not a real handicap friendly country, you know. No, the bigger no, cities, there's a lot more handicap ramps and things, but not in these smaller, you know, yeah. outgoing towns, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No. Not very no. handicap friendly. Yeah. Um, Charlie and Delisa belong to uh, the same homestead group that we belong to, and they also belong to our photography club. Right. So we're <laughs> we're all members of that, and uh, we have a member in our photography club who fell and broke her wrist, and was just getting the cast off, and then fell and broke her hip. So it's like uh, double whammy. Uh, and but that's yeah. that's how it happens here. I mean, uh, when you get a little older, you got to slow down and really watch where you're walking here. Mm -hmm. It can be dangerous. It's dangerous even if you're not old or decrepit. It's just dangerous because there's little things that stick up out of the sidewalk that you don't know that are going to be there and then all the drop-offs everywhere. Anyway, it, it's I've taken so many pictures of because I've thought about writing an article or you know a blog post or something about the sidewalks here because they're unbelievable. I mean, we should have some pictures in here to show how uneven they are. You can have risers that are foot and a half tall, mm -hmm. but the tread's only about that wide, you know, just yeah. like maybe six inches. Right. And Very the one below, it's only that high. Yeah. <laughs> and the width of them is also great variety. It could be super wide or it could be like this wide. And anyway, we walk all the time, which is because we live close to town. <laughs> but, you know, in terms of difficulties, a lot of things would have been difficult, but they weren't because we are blessed. We are just blessed. One of our <laughs> renters, name is John, took a real interest in helping with a lot of things, including before we moved here, we actually had our house renovated that we bought, the little house that's close to town. It wasn't <laughs> in very good shape, but it... By the time we got here, when we moved here in March, it was done and we were ready to move into and John was very helpful in that. But when, but he was also, you know, he, he took us by the hand and, and went with us to get our cell phone hooked up and our um, internet hooked up and where do you pay the water bill and how do you take care of the electric bill. And, and course, how do you get around town? <laughs> right. And, and what taxi drivers should we call? And how do you ride the bus to Loja? And how do you get off at um, Super Maxi and get back on? I mean, things that would have been a long time coming. But, you know, for our first two or three weeks, he just about did everything with us. And then it was kind of like, OK, we know what we're doing. <laughs> At least we think we did. <laughs> well, I mean, we knew the basics. And mm -hmm. 
And then the other part that was a huge blessing was, as I mentioned to you earlier, Bob. Bob the Builder. His Bob last the name. Builder. Bob, is, Bob Knapp is his name, but he would call him Bob the Builder. He's from Colorado, but he's been here, and he, um, he is he, not only a jack of all trades, he's kind of a master of quite a few. And he has been renovating our first home that we bought, and we actually have another one that we're living in now that he's also renovated. And between him and John, we haven't gone through the learning curve of you know, choosing the wrong people to do projects or something, and, or even knowing that we needed people to do projects. I mean, we didn't even know what we needed. And, but with, with Bob, you know, he'd walk through the house with us and we'd talk about what we needed. And then the next thing we know, we've got a team of guys, Ecuadorian people, usually five or six of them, that just come in like a bunch of... Uh, Little ants. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and they know what they're doing. They do good work. And yeah, Bob is over, overseeing it all. And, um, and we wouldn't have known who to call. And the thing is, we have heard other people's stories who they knew of like a handyman kind of person and they hired him to do some work and they were just worked directly with him and it may not have turned out very well and the person wasn't an expert. And, and so we didn't go through any of that. We've been so fortunate. And those things could have been really difficult because we don't speak the language worth beans. I'm getting better but I've got a long way to go. I won't say anything about Charlie. <laughs> I'm not quite as motivated as she is. But... Yeah. <clears throat> well, you've only been here nine months. I mean, it really takes a while to learn the language. Um, oh, sure. We've been here six years, and I wouldn't necessarily call us fluent. Mm -hmm. um, we get by. We mm -hmm. know enough Spanish to get things done. Like, you know, if we have workers here who don't speak English, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, right now, they all do speak English very well. Wow. But, um, you know, we, we do have to go and, and deal with government officials and things. Right. And, sure. And sometimes right. it's better to take a translator with you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you're going to hear stories here of, of really bad construction projects. You know, just a lot of those really sad, sad stories. But then you also hear some really great stories mm -hmm. as well, you know. Yeah. Um, we, we chose a good contractor. I, I would say it took a lot longer than we thought it would. And the, the rolling joke here was dos semanas más, you know, two more weeks, two more weeks, only two more weeks. And we got two more weeks for about six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, there's just, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, mm -hmm. It's a different pace. But it's like that other places, too. I mean, the projects that we did in Alaska always took longer than we thought they would. I mean, if we were doing them, they took longer. If we hired them, they usually took longer. So that seems to be human nature, but I know, I understand that it might be even more so here. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and some of our renovation projects is like, we get to a certain point, it's like, well, you know, we really would like this other thing done too, you know, and it just kind of keeps adding to it. And... Yeah, and it's not because they were slow. It's because yeah. we have just continued to do more and more and more and more things. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So let me ask, as, as vegans, and that's a bad word in this house. I can't believe I even let them in the door. <laughs> no, but as vegans, all kidding aside, how do you find the restaurants here? Able to pick some out here in Vilcabamba or not? Well, we've never gone to restaurants much. Not, and not just here, but everywhere. But anyway. Because it's, you know, it's not easy. And a lot of times, no matter what restaurant it is, it's rare that we get something that's better than what we would have at home. And that's and not yes. just because we're vegan. Because before I was vegan, I still rarely ate in restaurants, partly because I'm too cheap, because for the amount on the restaurant, you know, I could buy a week's worth of groceries, and it's like, well, what is, you know, why would I do this? But the other thing is I'm a pretty good cook. Yes, <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah. So, so, you know, we, I, we kind of feel the same way. Um, you know, there are restaurants here that we like, but some of the restaurants here have gotten U.S. pricing in their head. Mm -hmm. And so, and, yeah. and what we find offensive is to pay that kind of money and then come home hungry. Mm. That's yeah. just not good. Um, but with my stomach the way I've had my problems for the last 
12 months or so, we rarely eat out at all. Mm -hmm. um, everything's done here at home. On Sundays, we have our little group. We go to Sammy's restaurant, a little mm -hmm. plug for Catherine over at Sammy's. Um, mm -hmm. But we go there on Sunday afternoon because we have a group of friends who join us. And so that's a nice outing. I just very select about what I eat. Mm -hmm. um, if you're, my stomach's got a long history of problems, but if you're new to Ecuador, you're gonna have about six months of issues till you get the right bacteria happening down there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have experienced mm -hmm. any of that. Well, you don't well, eat out, so. Well, and, but even so, I mean, we eat the food that's grown here, so we're still gonna get that, you know, because, yes. you know, we're living in a new place. And I would say that there was a little adjustment for me. It wasn't difficult, you know, just a noticing that my digestion was had a few different <laughs> yeah it took a little while to get to the point where it felt more normal and but yeah it wasn't hard for us it so was, you guys buy most of your vegetables at the saturday mercado or yes yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 we try to do organic most of the time well we do it, and you know in between saturdays there are times that we need to go buy something but i have to say the garden's getting better and some of the things that we eat every single day I'm able to pick from the garden. And Excellent. of course it's organic. And I have to say much thanks to you for helping to give me some idea what to do to take care of our terrible soil. That's the worst part of Ecuador. <laughs> <laughs> the soil, I was so, I, I just was in disbelief because you look around, there's stuff growing everywhere and of course you get to hear it from some people like, oh yes, there's great, you know, rich soil. Fertile it's like, soil. Yeah. And it's not yes. like that at my house, you know, mm. although we have two houses now and the second house has much better soil, even though they're like a one minute walk away from each other. And I don't know why, but hard mm. clay soil. I mean, it's like concrete until it gets wet. And then it looks like quicksand. It can suck you right down and you may never get out. So anyway, <laughs> The plants are just like, you know, the ones that grow here naturally and the fruit trees and the flowers, they seem to do great, but the vegetables, but we are learning, much thanks to you and some other things. We haven't had a chance to get our own compost going yet, but we will be starting that, well, so as, we soon as, <laughs> as soon as he builds the bins. Um, but it's been hard because our whole yard is like a construction area, so, but mm. soon. But and that's a, that's have, a must here is having good yeah, compost. Yeah, absolutely. Just, absolutely. Right. It was I mean, a it's must a must there. wherever you live, but I think yeah. here mm -hmm. you, you can't just run out and buy good compost. No, no. it's not you easy. You sure can. No. And you can no. go and buy a bono and it's, yeah. not, it's not much. But anyway, in spite of that, we have a pretty good garden right now. So good. I don't grow near as many different things and it's not, I used to have a really big garden and have little gardens here and there now. But anyway, um, that was probably the biggest thing that I didn't know how to get around. Because some of the other things, like how do you buy things here, that's a challenge sometimes. Mm -hmm. But how do you make the soil be different than it is? And you know, there's so much organic matter here, and yet the soil is bare and we need mulch. We need, you know, the organic material and the life back in the soil and we don't have it. And of course the big stuff that falls down lies there and it doesn't break down very fast. But we did buy a wood chipper, which we haven't had a chance to use yet, but we did buy one. So we're planning on Excellent. making our mulch. So yeah, we loved it. We had one chipped in and I mean, it was expensive to do so, but it was mm -hmm. worth it. We, mm -hmm. all of our trees we trim yeah i'll go through there and into the compost pile that's mm -hmm. what we need and we have one but it's not Excellent. hooked up yet you'll be offering to trim your neighbor's trees pretty soon <laughs> we will <laughs> <laughs> we will yeah. yeah so you know we just did a whole video on gardening here and the mm -hmm. challenges that go with that it's yeah. it's it's not all that they say it is um yeah the realtors you know paint kind of a rosy picture and yeah, yes it doesn't didn't quite pan out the way we yeah. pictured it. Well, the thing is, the ones that we knew weren't gardeners. Yeah. And so they didn't know. They look around and they see, you know, the Saturday market's full of vegetables. They must 
be growing, so it must be yeah. good. So anyway, um, we, we've learned how to... One of the things that I've found interesting, and it, it suits my personality, okay, is <laughs> when you, you know, being plant-based eaters, and doing our, my own cooking, I have to buy things at the store and I need to buy beans and grains in addition to the vegetables and a lot of the fruits grow on our property. But when you go to the store, <laughs> they have bags of many different kinds of beans and grains and flowers, F-L-O-U-R, flour, but with no labels on them. I think they buy them in big bulk amounts and then they put them in little plastic bags and they tie a knot in the bag and it's on the shelf and you have no clue what's in the bag. <laughs> and so Surprise. <laughs> and so when it's beans, I don't worry about it too much. Although the last time I bought beans and it turned out to be corn, which really surprised me. But anyway, I, I can recognize it better next time because the corn doesn't look like what I call corn. But anyway, so it's like, well, it's always a surprise and uh, surprises aren't bad. Yeah, <laughs> learning experiences. <laughs> and you'll, you'll figure out like the uh, the green peas that they sell here in the bag. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, those take about two days of soaking and another day of cooking. Yes, mm -hmm. they do. Where they're ready to eat. They're, yeah. uh, right. they're pretty hard. They are. Yeah. Yeah, and I've learned that some things I won't buy again, and other things are pretty good. And it's like, okay, but you know, some of these things are true everywhere. I mean, I've I've taught... Uh, nutrition and cooking classes for many years and before I came here and just getting people to be willing to try something new is often the hurdle you know it's not that they actually wouldn't like it but they're afraid to try something new and so this is the great place to try new things because you don't know what you're getting <laughs> <laughs> well and you can't get a lot of the things that you're used to getting you know it's just you know it's just different here and yeah. Um, we find that with a lot of different things, you know, and for me, being, doing a lot of construction, remodeling kind of things, I'm used to dealing with wood and drywall. Well, that doesn't happen much here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mostly concrete <laughs> yeah, and various concrete forms and of it. Yeah, and bricks. And so, you know, I have to learn how they do things and, you know, Different tools, different ways, and oh, and <laughs> how they do electrical. Well, we'll just grind a channel through your wall here to put the wires through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's part of the adventure though, isn't it? it? Oh yeah, it absolutely. Really it's, it's been fun. You know, the first remodel was they did while we were, before we came down. We actually moved down in March. But the second remodel we're doing now, which is getting close to the end, so we're getting to watch how they do things. And it's, I don't know, I'm fascinated to see how resourceful they are and how willing they are to do work that nobody that I ever met before would be willing to do. To chisel out concrete for hours, hours, to just get <laughs> one thing done. And it's like, yeah, well, I wouldn't want to do that. We had this big retaining wall built on the to her house Huge. and every single bit of concrete in there is carried by a five gallon bucket on somebody's shoulder yes yes and, and you and know mixed with a shovel yeah. yeah they mix their their cement here on the ground with shovels yeah once in a blue moon you'll see they'll have a cement mixer out yeah. there we we actually bought a cement mixer finally mm. and now we don't have that many cement projects to go but <laughs> but we went ahead and bought one so hmm. one of the things I think that's kind of interesting here too is the workers, um, they think nothing about being on three levels of scaffolding right. made out of bamboo with some <laughs> brick shoved under one end and you know, no OSHA safety approved straps or anything like that in this country. Oh, These no. guys take their lives into their own hands daily. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's really bad. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we have, they were in the process of building the metal framework that's gonna hold the roof over our gate. And you know, the, the main maestro, he, he was just walking across the, the main tubing between those two ends of the wall several times and he just 
dun, 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 you know, it's like, like a tightrope walker. Like the size of a two by four that he's walking across. Yeah. 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 I mean, I used to do that when I was younger, but I don't do that <laughs> much now. And yeah. they're so strong. Most yeah. of the people are pretty small. These men are small. And they are so strong. And Bob was saying, yeah, they can all carry 200 pounds because they can carry two bags of cement at the same time. And so, you know, I'll go into town and buy things like plants because we're putting lots of, I'm a plant lover. So anyway, we're putting in trees and azalea or um, bougainvillea and everything. So I come back with lots of plants in the back of a pickup taxi which is another story. But anyway, these guys just come running from their jobs and they come and they start picking up all these things and trotting down the steps with them and they're big and or those big bags of ST2 that are really big and heavy and they just go trotting down with them and uh, they're amazing. We've so enjoyed them. If, if you had to give people some suggestions about what they should think about doing here, probably number one is if you're gonna move here, um, Find somebody to help you with relocation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Someone who knows Definitely. how to get the water turned on in your name. And right. I mean, we had that. We had a wonderful person in my day, and she she was so good for us. Help mm -hmm. us get the cell phones. Mm -hmm. All of yeah. these things take time, and, and yeah. you have to know where to go. And if you don't have that, you're a little lost. It would well, be very hard. Well, yeah. and it's like Delisa said, we were just blessed because we had helpers all along the way, and you know, yeah, like John and. Bob the Builder, he's just... So that'd I be mean, the second thing, call Bob the Builder. <laughs> that's right. right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And probably yeah. the third thing is be flexible. Right. Mm -hmm. And see it as an adventure. I mean, for us, uh, the whole thing, starting back in last year, October, you know, we would just keep reminding ourselves and each other, well, this is part of the adventure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Selling all my tools. <laughs> I always tell the story about a, a friend of ours, and you know this guy. We were here maybe six months, and I was having lunch with him. And he looks at me, he says, you know, he says, um, you're weird. And I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I got a few words to say about you. <laughs> but he says, uh, no, no, you have to think about this. To leave your home country, all your family, come to a place where you don't know anybody, and right. you know, move here, mm -hmm. he says, you got to be a little different. I said, I prefer to call it the pioneering spirit. You know? <laughs> Still and, being weird. <laughs> and that's really what it is. You gotta have that sure. adventure spirit. Right. You have to, mm -hmm. you know, right. not to be afraid of the unknown, but to kind of embrace it and go, okay, well, right. we'll see where that takes us. Mm -hmm. And even, and you know, it does sound like it's a big deal and, and it is. And yet I think back to all of our forefathers and mothers and what they did when they left whatever country they and came to the US or wherever they went. And they didn't have cell phones, they probably didn't have much money in the bank, and they didn't know anybody where they were going, and they somehow made it work. My parents kind of did that when they left Louisiana when I was six years old and drove up the Alcan Highway to Alaska with four kids, the oldest being nine and the youngest being five. Um, drove to Alaska in a bus without any idea what they were going to find and how they were going to live. And an old school bus. In an old school bus. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And <laughs> back in 1957. And so it's like, you know, that was much harder than what we did. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it had the potential to be a lot harder. I don't, I think they had a good adventurous spirit then, but it would be hard. Yes, yes. You know, we call Alaska the the final frontier. Yeah, you know, the last frontier, you know. right. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's my grandparents moved from Rising Star, Texas to Roswell, New Mexico. Ah, and mm -hmm. they loaded everything um, onto a wagon with a mule. And then their oldest son followed them with a Model T pickup. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> off they went and they wound up in Roswell. Right, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's just. So it's all relative compared to staying at home with you know, everything that you're used to, yes, this, this is different. I have to say one thing about the reaction of other people, because that's a question that I've heard you ask other people. Um, our friends and the people that 
we didn't know, but they were <laughs> we coming to the house. Too. We <laughs> sold, you know, we were selling everything, everything. And people come to the house and they'd go, oh, are you moving? Yeah, oh, where are you moving? Ecuador. <laughs> like, what? You know, Their eyes would get big and they go, And wow. then they would be fascinated, yeah. totally. Oh, wow, why Ecuador? Oh, that sounds exciting. And I have a, a, you know, a email list of people that have taken my classes and so forth in the past, and they love hearing my stories. And I think many of them, I mean, they feel a certain admiration for this, the fact that we've done it, and a little bit of envy, because I think they all would like to have more adventure and more just, let's do life. Mm -hmm. It's not for everybody, you know. Some people no, just not. aren't able to, to do that and to do what right. we've done. Right. It's just mm -hmm. not in their character, their build, or whatever. It doesn't make. It just makes them different. That's all. Sure. Yeah. But there's a lot of even those people that I think, and they are, they've said that to me. I would never be able to do that, but I think it's cool that you're doing it. Yeah, you yeah. could, you could. <laughs> if you're willing yeah. to to compromise a little. And, and not let the little things get to you. Right. I have sure. a friend building right now, and I'm like, dude, this is gonna give you a heart attack. Um, mm -hmm. You need to really let go of some of this and just mm -hmm. you know, be firm. Hey, this is what I want, but mm -hmm. it takes two more weeks, it takes two more weeks, right? <laughs> yeah, and it may not be exactly what you want. It may you not know? be exactly what you want, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many times I've said this, we doing the renovations of our house, and it's like, well, this is just gonna be one of those quirky little things about our Ecuador house. You know, it's just, you know, it's never gonna get perfect. It's just gonna be the way it is. <laughs> yeah, you know, our front doors don't close right. Oh, well, yeah. you know, right. it's just the way it is. We live with it. Yeah. So, yeah, and you know, it's just, yeah, it's mm -hmm. just the way it is here. The yeah. good part is that there's no snow drifting through the cracks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there's no snow, you know. And, and uh, it does get a little warm, but not too much for us up here. Mm -hmm. um, we're quite a bit cooler, but I mean, there we, we bought a couple fans just for those, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. rare is. moments. And we bought a little heater for that one or two nights of the year that we need mm -hmm. a little heat in the bedroom, but it just, mm -hmm. it's very rare. I mean, we're having a fireside chat right now. Right. The fire is not going. <laughs> It'd be way too hot in here if we it built a fire be. in that yeah. fireplace. Yeah. Um, it's that, a nice ornament. Yeah. Well, that has been another thing that's been kind of an adjustment from us for us coming from Alaska. You know, it when it gets then that's clear and sunny, that sun is intense. You know, it's and intense, it, it, yeah. it feels really hot. <laughs> you know, yeah. even though the temperature may not be you know, maybe it's in the high 70s, but it it feels hot. And you've and, either got to wear some kind of sunscreen or a hat or something. And well, you see the Ecuadorian women wearing, uh, walking around with umbrellas. Uh -huh. And yeah, sure. they know that that sun's hot and devastating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, these are all good things for people to hear. Anything else that you, you want people to know about Ecuador and Vilcabamba in particular? You mentioned the traveling to Vilcabamba being a little more difficult than it is. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a morning flight and an evening flight. Mm -hmm. um, right now, is it just not every day right now? It's only three days a week now? I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah. it's only three days a week. It may be more. Um, and so sometimes they'll come to fly in here in the afternoon and the wind's too much. And they'll turn around and go back to Quito. And mm -hmm. so you have to try again the next morning. Yeah. Um, that happens. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, it's one thing that I've discovered is that if living in Vilcabamba, if you want to leave Ecuador, might as well plan on spending the night in Quito. Yep. Because you're not going to get out of here and make a flight in Quito unless it just is a, just happens that way because that's not how most of the flights just go. Just doesn't plan. Just mm -hmm. The only way you can do that is leave out of Vilcabamba in the morning on a morning flight and then you get up to Quito, and then you'll be leaving Quito at like eight o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so it's, you're going to be later. spending the day in Quito. Yeah. Well, when we went back to Alaska after the retreat, we got as far as Miami. I mean, we flew 
from Vilcabamba, well, drove to, from Vilcabamba to the Aloha Airport and then to Quito, and then we got on the plane to Miami. But when he went to visit his family, he went through Houston, and that required an overnight. Did it? Yeah. yeah. But I think I would have rather stayed overnight in Quito than in Miami. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she didn't have a good experience. In no. <clears throat> no. There's some travel horror stories, I'll tell you. Yeah. And the one thing about flying into Loja is it's a, an hour's cab drive mm -hmm. from the airport right. to here. Mm -hmm. And if the road's washed out, it may be an hour and a half because you may have to go around the other way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and that does happen. Mm -hmm. But most of the time they find a little well-known path that they'll drive around and mm -hmm. still get you here. But That was the one thing that was really funny. They've actually built a new road from... Um, oh, come on. Um, that goes to Catamayo. Catamayo. And the road, the new road stops like a hundred yards from the old road. It just stops. And <laughs> one of the cab drivers didn't realize that that was the way. He drove all the way there and oh, we, and so he had to backtrack oh, my all the goodness. way around. Lost like half an hour in travel yeah. time trying to get the <laughs> yeah, that's the way it is. And the cab drivers here, I mean, they're, they get you there, but sometimes it's a little scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I have to say that the, the Vilcabamba cab drivers, that they drive pickups, which, I mean, the cab drivers here are not the same as cab drivers everywhere because they pick up everything for you. And I think you've probably talked about that other times. But anyway, they can do all kinds of like personal assistance things. And they, the, ride, the drive is usually quite sane. But if you're in a little yellow cab between here and Loja, I hope you have life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> the taxi Ruta uh, runs like every 15 minutes between here and Loja, and that's the little yellow cabs. And those guys, they all think that they have to be in Loja in a certain amount of time or they get in trouble. And I don't think it really is that way, but they think that's, that's what it is. So well, I drive like that. Well, yes. it is or not. I said, never again. If I get out alive, I'm taking the bus next time. The bus is much more relaxing. The thing to do with the taxi route is pay for the whole taxi. Right. And but then they you still... can tell them to drive slow. I paid for the whole taxi, muy despacio. Let's just go slow all the way to Loa. And, and I have no it? problem tapping them on the shoulder and going, uh uh. You know? <laughs> and and they'll, they're generally. Slow down, mm -hmm. um, but then you're paying for the whole taxi. Well, yeah. that's yeah. a small matter compared to the way they drive. Yes, exactly. <laughs> One of the great things about South America, <laughs> Ecuador in particular. Yeah. yeah. Well, I so much appreciate you folks being here and doing this with us today, sure. and um, I hope uh, the folks at home will reach out. I, I and I, you know, you said you have an email list of all these people. I don't know why they're not all subscribers to my That's channel. That's right. Why aren't they? <laughs> well, maybe they, maybe will, they be will be. be. <laughs> uh, a shameless plug there. Um, <laughs> so uh, definitely, if, if people want to reach out to you on my YouTube channel, you feel free to answer their questions if they have questions. Okay, and, sure. Uh, you know, feel, make it like it's yours. Thank and, you. Uh, okay. So Charlie and Delisa, thank you so much. I uh -huh. appreciate you thank being you. here and willingness to share your lives with us. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. All right, folks, you know what to do next. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you want to learn more about living in Vilcabamba, check out our playlist, Living in Vilcabamba. Thanks. <laughs>